common knowledge that abuse victims take up to an average of seven attempts before they're finally able to leave a pathological love relationship. To the outside world, this looks like simple math. You just are unhappy, you get up and you walk out. But it's not. In this episode of Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse, we're going to take a closer look at why that advice rarely works. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy, a clinical mental health specialist and also abuse survivor. I'm thrilled you're joining me today. Be sure to subscribe so you're notified of upcoming episodes and let us know what you think by leaving a review. This is a listener-supported podcast. Consider donating the cost of a cup of coffee to help support us. So let's listen in to this episode of a replay of a TikTok Live. I find it intriguing how hard it is, how mysterious narcissistic abuse is to the outside world who's not personally experienced it. From, the, from an outside perspective, it appears very straightforward, direct, that we, we go into the relationship with equal standing. Um, we have full control, uh, free will, and all our faculties. It's very hard to explain what it's like to be in a relationship in which your sense of self has been battered and you've come to distrust your own feelings. And you couple that with the isolation, which happens super subtly. You don't realize that you're cutting off more and more of your relationships, either because you don't feel safe leaving this person alone on their own or because they make these other people not likable they have criticism about them, there's something they bring up that, that causes a sense of alienation, or what's happening is so odd and you feel ashamed that you can't tell anybody what's happening because they're, they would look at you like, what are you doing? You're crazy. And then wonder why you're staying. It just is complicated. It is not easy to explain to an outsider. What makes it really hard and I'm sure you all experience this at some level, but it's especially hard as a creator is that you end up then he hearing these comments, you know, you get ex faced with the simplicity, the, the perspective that we come into relationships on equal standing and people want to know why you put up with it and why you stay. I'm sure it's happened to you. I'm sure when you go into work or you're sitting down with your friends after a long day, and you're having a drink over wine or something, and you bring up a little bit, you give them a taste of what's happening, and everybody's eyes go wide and the room falls silent. And then you end up just shutting down because it's too hard and it's too complicated and you know that you're gonna get advice at the end of the day that won't help. And then you'll have added to people who now more people are criticizing you and judging you, and you already had a lot of judgment at home. You don't need more of it coming from the outside world. I have a feeling this is a very familiar place for a lot of us. It's very hard to find help. It's very hard to find a, a support from those who actually get it, who will help you regain a sense of control and look at it realistically and help you feel a shred of self-worth for being in this toxic relationship. I thought I had a clue as a psychologist listening to people's problems for over 20 years. Hour after hour, I would listen to people's problems. I considered myself extremely well-informed. I worked at a hospital, psychiatric hospital. I, I worked in a community mental health facility for a little while. I worked with abused children and runaways for a period of time. I considered myself very well-informed in addition to doing private practice therapy. I had no idea that these intelligent people who were coming in and sitting across from me, who were telling me something was going wrong at home, had been so systematically beaten down and internally battered that they really couldn't tell me everything that was going on, that they didn't feel safe now with anyone, including me, certainly not me, and that some of the worst abuse probably has happened from the medical or mental health community. I have a feeling a lot of you can relate to that, that you yourselves have seen people who are supposedly in your corner who have made it worse. I would love to uh, turn this over to talk to you about your issues. Um, I wanna just sort of bring this up to kind of start here today 
it, I just posted a video. What kind of launched me into this thinking was there was a creator who, who uh, those of you who haven't followed Manjeet Ruprai's page, please do. She's fantastic. She also is a hypnotherapist and narcissistic abusive coach. But she, she did a video, and I guess it was a while ago, about how people end up pregnant in these relationships and get trapped and how things like pregnancy, engagements, marriages, and all sorts of things like this, they end up using some big life event as a way to get you, you know, in the relationship, in, in a you know, kind of a, a, a power inequity so that you feel at a disadvantage. And as a result of that, then you're stuck with this person for the rest of their lives. And as a result, uh, it's very hard to get out. Another creator stitched her and basically attacked detect every victim under the world for being stupid enough to be caught in one of these relationships. And so this is where I was coming from is I, I just did a video kind of doing a rebuttal because what I don't, what people don't understand, this is what I'm seeing on my videos as well, is that with the one, for example, on charm, I getting, how, I'm amazed. How can I get so much backlash over saying what Gavin De Becker and his book, The Gift of Fear, along with Robert Greene in The 48 Laws of Power, as well as now I'm reading a new book called Something's Not Right by Wade Mullen. So I'm talking three different men, men have come out and said that charm is a coercive tactic used by abusers as a way to manipulate people. All of us, you know, both genders. And then I get attacked and people come at me. It's like, have you been hurt much? How insulting. I, it was a fact. I wasn't making a personal statement. I was just sharing. I was just sharing a fact that I found in three different books that's well established. I, could, I pulled out quotes even and put up quotes. doesn't really matter. I still hear the, what a victim I am for having this negative view of the world. There's a lot of really fascinating questions. Let me jump into one that I just saw that crossed about covert narcissism. I don't know if you guys know of Dr. Romani. She, um, has a YouTube channel. I highly recommend you check out her stuff. Another great YouTuber that you should be following is Sam Vanknin, V-A-K-N-I-N, Sam Vanknin. Both of these individuals are professionals, uh, professors or educators, as, and I know that, I don't know if Sam's a psychologist, but Dr. Romani is a psychologist with lots of loads of experience with narcissistic abuse. There has been a change in the way in which we subtype narcissism. In the past, Covert narcissists were called covert narcissists, but now we're beginning to talk about them or think of them as a vulnerable narcissist and using the word covert in a different way. So you're going to see content that's probably going to lead you to feel confused because they're using the same word to describe something different. So that's why I want to, I love this question. We can jump into it and really talk about it. So what is covert narcissist? And then how, what do we mean when we say covert narcissism today? Because it's actually something very different today. It's covert and overt form of narcissism. It's not actually a subtype. It's a form of narcissism. So let me explain what a vulnerable narcissist is first, and then I'll discuss what covert versus overt narcissism is. Why are they changing it? I don't know. But I want you to know, because if you end up with hearing this material, I want you not to be like, what? I don't get this because, you know, it just gets really complicated. A vulnerable narcissist is different from a grandiose narcissist. Most of the time when we think of a narcissist, we think of grandiose. That's the person who's the life of the party. They, they tend to take center stage. They know a whole lot about, they seem to know a whole lot about whatever, maybe a topic. They seem to be a big expert. They're loud. They brag. They, they think they're all that and they generally have a lot of charisma and they are generally quite likable and you kind of, they're kind of fun to be near and uh, around and have them entertain you. But if you get in a relationship with them, you're going to find out that they don't have empathy, that they actually are quite competitive and need to always be in center stage and that there's really not room for anyone in their world but themselves. And they're just kind of over the top all the time, over the top. A, a vulnerable narcissist is sort of the inverse. It is the it is the narcissist that everything goes wrong for. They want to be the grandiose narcissist, but they're not. They're actually the perpetual victim. So it's the implosion. Imagine that there is an explosion of narcissism. That's the grandiose, but the the vulnerable is the implosion. They implode in within themselves. It's always all about them, just like the grandiose, but always all about them, about what went wrong. 
Why is life more fair? Why is always everything bad happened to them? You'll hear this kind of perpetual sad sack per picture of how it's, you know, bad. Now, what's what's dangerous about them? What's very insidious about them is that this sensitive, the seemingly victim discussion feels sensitive. It feels emotional because they're talking about their emotional experience, the the failures and the pain and. You know, there's a lot of pity that you, you hear. You, you hear all of that and you think to yourself, oh, this person gets it and life is hard for them and they'll understand when life is hard for me. And so you end up thinking that this person has emotional capacity that they don't. They don't have any more emotional capacity than the grandiose narcissist does. So all the other things are the same. No self-reflection, lack of empathy, um, it's egocentricity only it's around their victimization. So all of the other things that you see that are hallmarks of a grandiose, a vulnerable has only in a sense of their victimhood is what is, is championed instead of their above the top superior skills. Both groups thinks they're entitled. Both groups thinks things should be better for them. Both groups envy other people and are very competitive. So that's the difference between a grandiose and a vulnerable. I have to tell you, I am super jazzed about this upcoming event. It is a live webinar with Dr. Kristen Milstead, author of Why Can't I Just Leave? Waking Up and Walking Out of a Pathological Love Relationship. What she's written in this book is amazing. It is the book. If you're struggling to exit, then this is the book that you want to get in order to understand why you're feeling trapped, why it's so hard to get out. And we're going to be doing a live interview with her, along with me and several other panelists. We're going to be talking about what is cognitive dissonance? Why does it cause us to feel so confused and trapped? How is it related to a trauma bond? And how do you break a trauma bond if you're still unsure exactly what happened? Be sure to get your tickets. Space is going to be limited. You can find this in the show notes below. It's going to be on August 18th at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. And again, like I said, I cannot wait for this interview. So I hope to see you there as well. What do we mean when we say covert versus overt narcissism? Well, every form of narcissism has what we see. It's what people display the bragging, the, the breaking of the rules, you know, the excessive kind of external focus on themselves, the cutting in line and pushing ahead, the, the manipulation, all of that, the, the, the things that impact you and me, that's the overt side, the, the obvious. Think of overt like outward side. It's the what shows up. But there's a hidden part of every narcissist, the, the, the interior world, how they see themselves, what they fantasize about, what they want, the way in which they justify things and defend things and avoid things. All the hidden part that's interior, the interior world is the covert part. It's the, think of covert as hidden. It's the hidden part from you and I that we don't know about because they don't really let us in. And they probably don't know a lot of it because they don't listen to themselves a whole lot. Now, when you hear the word covert, think of it as covert versus overt, which is how narcissism is expressed. And think of what we used to think of as a covert narcissist is really now being called a vulnerable narcissist. So I hope that was helpful. Um, what do we do about both groups and can some they change? I saw that question kind of pass the screen. Well, that's a really tough issue. The change, I mean, do I believe humanity can change? I wouldn't have gotten into the job of being a psychologist if I didn't think people could do some changing. The problem is that these things are pervasive. It's a, it's a persistent way of seeing the world and seeing themselves. And when you don't have the ability to be self-reflective, you know, think about it. What's the purpose of quality control at a company? Let's say you're at Ford, you know, and the cars are coming off the assembly line and you're getting reports back that something's breaking on the car. So what you do is you go and you take a big look at what's happening. This part, how does it hold up? Can it, can it hit the metrics of resistance that it's supposed to? Is it really strong? All these things that you ask in order to make a proper change so that the problem goes away, right? That's what we do in quality control. The problem with narcissists is with when you lack what's called introspection or self-reflection, 
there's no quality control. That would be like saying, yeah, there's a problem. And you look over the assembly line and you look over the part and say, looks fine to me because you don't really like do any testing on it. You don't challenge yourself on it. And, and then you just assume that it's good to go and you go back to things as they were. That's what happens. And change doesn't happen when we don't do that. Then we keep having the same problem going on and on and on. The reason they struggle with that is because in their core, each of our core is our self or sense of self. And, and narcissists, sociopaths, and psychopaths' sense of self is very fragile or weak, very vulnerable. It's not set up very well. It's like it's like trying to build a house on no foundation at all. So you've got this self, this person, and there's not things that sort of buttress them, that hold them up and make them feel secure, know that they're okay and that they have a place and it's okay to fail and it's okay to be human and they don't know that. And at a deep level, nonverbal level, this is lacking. And so if it's lacking, you can't look because if you look, you see it, you don't know what to do with it. And then you, you collapse, you collapse, just like a house built with no foundation collapses, they collapse. So that's why they don't do that. They don't do the work of that. What's the difference between sociopaths and psychopaths versus narcissism? Well, they're both cluster B personality disorders. And as a result, they're now referred to in the alternative model of diagnoses. DSM-5 has come out with a new way of diagnosing personality disorders called the alternate model. And it looks at self-direction, self-identity, intimacy, and empathy. So it looks at every personality style. And there are lots of personality styles. I don't know if you're aware of that. Dependency, schizoid, schizotypal, histrionic. I mean, I could list them. There's just lots of them. But of the cluster B group, which is known as antagonistic, and they mean that literally, antagonistic, which is the opposite of agreeable. There are not agreeable personalities. That includes histrionic, borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder is the DSM-5 diagnosis for sociopath and psychopaths. That group, they have, um, they're similar than to narcissists and similar to borderlines, but different. They're kind of a different makeup, but similar. What's similar is that they're also highly manipulative. They tend to also lie and be very deceptive. They're rule breakers and they're callous. They don't care that they're breaking a rule. They actually feel that they need to because it's a it's uh, everything's fair and love and war. And to them, we're all at war. And so you do what you need to do to survive. To them, the, the end justifies the means. They'll do whatever they need to do to do that. So there's this real cold ruthlessness, this sense of, I deserve this and you are a nothing because my survival is all that is pr uh, paramount here. So I will do what I have to take. So they're, they're very much a predator or a shark in our society. Yeah, they're, it's, they're fascinating. And their sense of self isn't so much shame-based, but more calculating, empty, and, and just calculating, very ruthless. What's really bad is when you see them mix with these other types, because that's the other problem, is these, these other types of disorders aren't necessarily clear-cut. You can have someone who has antisocial personality disorder with narcissistic personality traits or borderline personality traits, you can see these kind of fluid, you know, mixing of diagnoses. And that's not uncommon. That's very, very common. For example, I think Amber Heard's a, a, a great example that she was diagnosed as both histrionic and borderline personality disorder. She has a mix of both. And we also at times saw some narcissistic traits pop up as we saw how entitled and special she thought she was. So that's kind of an overview. But yes, I was back to the question, is it a spectrum? Narcissism is a spectrum. Sociopath, sociopathy, psychopathy is not on a spectrum. You aren't a little psych psychopathic or a lot. You're, you either you are or you are. It's, maybe I might be wrong about that, but that's my take on it. But narcissism is a normal developmental stage in which we all want to feel we're special. We all want to know that people understand us. That they have attunement, that they get us. And, you know, you see it in toddlerhood is when it first makes its first appearance. It comes back up in teenage years when people are trying to uh, cement their sense of identity. That's normal. Narcissism in those periods of time is very, very normal and expected. You hope that it gets resolved by adulthood and that you get a stable sense of self that's confident, can take risks, is self-reflective sees itself in the whole of the world, has a place, and everybody else has a place. You hope all these things happen. And if they don't, then you end up seeing someone who's developed more narcissistic traits. But you and I are somewhere on the spectrum. 
from maybe a little immature and some selfish sometimes to all the way to being very, very pathologically insensitive and manipulative. It's interesting. Somebody's proposing, is this an adaptive evolution of self-preservation in the ego? It, I mean, that's one other way to view it is to see it that way. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, it doesn't fit very well with society. I, so you th if you think of it as evolution, I'm just thinking out loud with you here. If it was evolutionary, wouldn't you think that it would have been eradicated? Because Well, I also can think arguments why it wouldn't be. I mean, those who get a play nicer tend to be seen as easier to get along with and you think they do better. But you're right. There is a level of ruthlessness and self-centeredness that does help us get take advantages. I'm thinking of... Um, I'm thinking of 2008 when uh, the collapse, the financial collapse, there was a lot of like narcissistic ruthlessness in that whole situation. What do we do? Um, you know, I, I see, does abuse always cause it? No, not always cause it. As I said, I think it's for lots of reasons. Some of it's genetic, some of it's upbringing. Sometimes it is trauma. I think sometimes it's just organic brain differences. I think you're going to find there's a whole host of reasons for that. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. I want to leave you with a couple of final thoughts. First, be sure to check out my new YouTube channel. I'm finally posting more content over there. Don't forget to get your tickets for Dr. Kristen Milstead's live webinar on August 18th at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. It's going to be so jam-packed of fantastic information like... How do you break a trauma bond? What is cognitive dissonance and why is that messing with things? You're going to find it helpful wherever you are in the healing stage. Space is limited, so don't wait. And finally, our show time for the podcast has changed. I don't know if you've noticed, but the new episodes now go live every Monday and Thursday morning. So I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye-bye.